from this. And Wallace asked him why. Grafner tried to explain it, but apparently never got every point across. So Wallace, in his book, gives a partial, a partial explanation of, for how this came about. Uh, and, and there's much more to the story. In fact, uh, Wallace and Grafner didn't have just one continued fraction. They had an infinite sequence of continued fractions, which have largely been forgotten. And I'm going to show it. Oh, OK. But the first thing that I wish to do is uh, show a, a formula that I uh, figured out about 15 years ago that shows you how to, how to go from this formula to this one. Now, if you can imagine, try to imagine this formula and then morphing it. You know, morphing like, like, like you show somebody at 20 years old and show their face, and then you show their face at 70 years old, and you morph it, you know, it gradually changes. So try to imagine morphing this formula into this. Okay. So I'm going to give you one formula which has a parameter in it. And as you change the parameter from 0 to 1 to 2, to, you, know, you see the morphing taking place in front of your eyes. Here is that. Oops. So a more traditional name is interpo interpo interpolating uh, between the two. They have parameters. In a way, in a way, I guess you can think of that. But I, I think morphing is a better word. Okay. Any, anyway, here's the formula. Now, the formula, just to look at it, doesn't tell you a lot. Uh, you see, half of it is a product with uh, beta-like terms, uh, factors. And uh, half of it is a, a, a product with uh, Wallace-type factors. And you can hardly see it here. There's a parameter n up there. And that's what we're going to work with. And everything is revealed on the next page. So when n is 0 in that formula, it spells out the original Wallace problem. Now when you said n equal to 1, what happens is the first factor in Vieta's product squeezes in, and every other factor up here is knocked out. So you'll notice it starts with this one, because this one's born, and then this one's skipped, and then you have this one. So it has every other, and you just keep doing that. In the next case, when n is 2, you get 2 beta factors. And now you knock out every other term here, every, every other factor. So this factor's out, you keep this one. This factor's out, you keep this one, and so on. And you just keep doing that. Now you got three beta's, and you knock out every other factor. And you keep going like that forever. And at infinity, you've knocked out all the Wallace factors, and you just have the beta factors. <laughs> okay. Um, and this was new. Was not this was, uh, as far as I know, uh -huh. it was new. Um, Except 300 years. And, and, at least. <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, it's remarkable, I mean, uh -huh. really. The, the, and I'll show you how I got it. It's really very simple. So, uh, okay. Now, uh, let me just very quickly, uh, just in the outline form show you how, uh, how one normally derives some of these things. We'll show you the, a modern derivation of the Wallace product here. Uh, the way Wallace did it was really ingenious and, and, and was an, uh, a wonderful uh, series of conjectures. And I'm, I'm going to uh, hint at that towards the end of the talk. But a modern way of doing it is very simple. You start with the infinite product for, uh, for the sine function. This is the one that was conjectured by Euler. It wasn't proved until the 19th century. But, uh, and it's, but it's very easy to conjecture. There's the 0 at 0, and here are the zeros at n pi. Anyway, uh, you can factor this, simple algebraic factoring, and divide by x, and then set x equal to pi over 2. And when you do that, sine becomes 1. You, Reciprocate that, and you get it right away. It just flies out. So it's very easy. Okay. 
Uh, a modern derivation of the eta's product, again, this did not have the eta did it, the eta did it geometrically with circles and polygons inside. We do it with trigonometry, and we use, it's all built around two uh, trigonometric identities. This one, the double angle formula for the sine, and this one, the half angle formula for the cosine, which you recognize right away. And what you do is you iterate. So you write this one down, and then you take this sine and you use the formula for that. See? So the sine of theta over 2 becomes cosine theta over half of that angle times another sine, and so on. You keep doing it. You keep iterating, and you wind up, and of course, each time you do it, you get an extra 2. So you wind up uh, with a product of cosines each time the angle is half the previous one. And then you end up with a sine one sign on the end, okay? Now, you replace each of these cosines by a formula of this type. So for the first one, you put that in. Now for the second one, you've got to put, you have to use the formula again for half this angle, so that replaces this cosine by this, and so on, you keep doing that. So when you do it for theta over two to the p, you wind up with p radicals like that. Okay. So we're almost done. On the next page, uh, we divide, there used to be a sign over here, we divide it by it here. Then you pass to the limit as p goes to infinity. This is a simple limit, it's like sine x over x. And, uh, and then you set theta equal to pi over 2, which knocks out all these cosines. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, and you get the a this product. So it, falls apart fairly, fairly simple. Now, how did, how did I get the Vieta-Wallace product that you just saw? Very simple. Uh, this came about uh, out of my habit of uh, playing a little game of trying to derive formulas that, I, that I've seen. Okay. So uh, about 15 years ago, I decided to play with Vieta's formula and say, can I derive it? And in the process of deriving it, I, uh, I took a wrong step that led to this, okay? And here's all it is. It's very simple, as you will see. Going back here, you'll notice at this step, there's a sign here. And all I did was I replaced that sign by the infinite product that you saw a moment ago when you did Wallace. And that's it. That builds in the Wallace part, and you've got it. It's that simple. That's really all there was to it. A happy accident. And, uh, and it led to this uh, result. Any questions about that? Any comments? OK. Oh, you know. Neil, um, I just want to mention that with the, uh, with the continued fractions here, written this way, uh, I'm going to write them in a uh, more compact form this way. Uh, this is what people uh, normally do. Instead of writing it so that it takes up uh, uh, two dimensions, we write it so that it's kind of linear. And we put the plus sign down here. So this is kind of down here, and this is below this one, by putting the pluses up here. OK? So we're now going to take a look at uh, Lord Breffner's forgotten sequence of continued fractions for pi. It turns out that in uh, Wallace's Arithmetica Infinitorum, he doesn't mention just that one uh, continued fraction, which is what everybody calls Lord Brauchner's continued fraction for pi. If you ask anybody today, what is Lord Brauchner's continued fraction for pi, they'll just say this. They won't say this. But those are in Wallace. Now, about 15 years ago, the Monthly published a paper entitled, A Beautiful Continued Fraction for Pi. It was this one. And it was published by Leo Lang. It's a very good paper. I'm not, I don't want to knock that paper because it taught me a great deal. Uh, but uh, uh, Leo Lang missed the fact that this formula and all these also are in that 1656 book by Wallace, 
but it's understandable that he would.